Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and today we're going to talk about corner weighting. There's a lot of misperceptions, people don't understand completely what corner weighting is, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the theory behind it, the concept of what corner weighting is, and then I'm going to move and I'm actually going to go through the process of corner weighting a car here. Um, so you can see what's involved, how it's done, what tools you need to do it, and uh, so you can see what's actually happening. So first off, corner weighting is basically ensuring that your weight distribution across your car is as equal as you can get it. Um, each of your tires has the same amount of load on them, on it, uh, so that they have effectively the same traction level and your car's handling is, you know, you have as much, tra as much grip as you can get, your handling is as consistent as it gets. Now there's a limit to what you can do by corner weighting in terms of shuffling this around, but what we're looking to do is optimize the platform as much as possible to make sure that, uh, to make sure it's as good as possible. Now I've got some, I've got some questions here. I, which I didn't write down. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I got some questions here that I will be I will be answering uh, over the course of this procedure. But feel free to throw any questions in the comments, and I will answer them as best I can live, uh, and hopefully show you what's going on. But first, we have my little friend here who's going to ex going to show us what corner weighting is all about. We need to zoom in here, Travis. This little guy in his futuristic race car with triple carburetors. Um, is well corner weighted. You can see he's he's sitting nice and flat on here. Now he's got a solid suspension, but you can use the solid suspension as the same sort of concept for what we're going to be doing. If one corner of his little race space car is off, you can see he's got a distribution problem here. He doesn't have, and you know I can push down on this and flex it, and all four of his little feet will end up on the ground, but most of the weight, or most of the load will be on this one. But you can see by the way it's sitting is that it's actually the two diagonals that are taking, you know, the, the one diagonally across from the high one that's taking the load and very little weight is on the other two corners. And this is important because when we are corner weighting, we will never be shifting weight front and back or side to side. We're only going to be shifting it diagonally. And here we'll show this again. We'll jack up, we'll lift up the front one. Look at that. He's nicely balanced again. His ride height's all jacked up, but he's nicely balanced. He's nice and stable. Same if I do the same on the back. Again, nice and stable. Got his ride height all, all messed up. But having just the one or diagonally opposite, it's just like a table at a restaurant. You know, it's always, it's never going to rock back and forward and back. It's always going to rock in a diagonal. And that's what we're dealing with here with corner weighting is we can only shift weight from this diagonal to that diagonal and vice versa. That's an important concept to come up with because otherwise people will start obsessing over trying to get the front rear weight balance right, whereas really you don't have any control over that with corner weighting. That's determined by where the heavy stuff is in your car. Any questions yet, Travis? Not yet. No, nope. well, thank you for our little spaceman for that, uh, that illustration. We'll put him aside. Um, so that, again, that, uh, that uh, concept of weight shift and diagonal, we're going to keep going back to that because it's very important. If you want to move weight front and back or side to side, but especially front and back and you decide you've got too much front weight, not enough rear weight, vice versa, you have to physically move stuff around. You actually have to take heavy things in the car and rot and move them from one area to another. You know, the battery is a classic example. It's why the battery is in the back of an NA and an NB Miata is to push that weight back a little bit. And that's actually something that we've done on the other generations as well. Um, our ND uh, cars will often put the battery in the trunk, opens up some space under the hood, but it also puts a 20 odd pound chunk of mass in the back of the car. Um, same with the NCs. We even hide them underneath the rear fender on some of those things. It's kind of a cool job. Um, there's not a lot of stuff you really can move around in many cases. And you can actually get yourself not so much in trouble, but you'll find when you lighten a car, it's much easier to lighten the back than it is the front, or at least from a, from a proportional standpoint, because the front's got that engine in it. There's only so light you can make that engine. It's a problem. So we are, uh, we're going to concentrate on the car. We're not going to move anything around in the car. I'm just going to be doing the corner weighting. Now, in order to corner weight a car, you need the ability to adjust the perch heights. So you need a coilover. What determines the ride height of the car is basically this piece here, the distance from the mounting point of the shock to the bottom of the spring perch, and then the spring perch, bottom spring perch to the uh, upper mount, minus whatever compression there is from the spring taking load. And what we're doing by moving these, uh, moving these perches up and down is we're basically effectively adjusting the length of these little legs and that will shift the load from, from uh, diagonal to diagonal. But you cannot corner weight a car unless you have the ability to adjust this perch. Um, 
Cars with uh, cars that are running coilovers that are made of two different pieces have adjustable body length. The effective is exactly the same whether you're moving the perch or whether you're moving the body length. What changes is the amount of free travel you have. We're not going to get in that today. I've talked about that in the past, but effectively you are changing this relationship. Um, that's what's going to be moving your weight around, effectively lengthening and shortening the legs on your table or your little space race car. So if you have a set of conies with standard perches, um, set of Tokikos, set of Bilsteins, whatever they are, but they do not have adjustable perches, I'm sorry, you cannot corner weight that. Um, I suppose you could if you started asking shims on here. Very high effort, a lot of work, much easier just to convert the shock over to some sort of coilover. You can do that with a sleeve like this. It's a ground control sleeve. Uh, this one is for, I don't know. <laughs> They've got slight different variations depending on the diameter of the shock and how they attach. But effectively, you take off the factory spring perch, you slide this over top, and it's got the ability to corner weight these. And there are a billion budget-minded versions of these on eBay. Um, we used ground control at uh, Fly Me Out in the past. I've been very happy with the, uh, with the quality of those. But that is how you can take a car with non-corner weightable shocks and make them corner weightable. Um, you will also need an adjustment tool for your, uh, for your purchase and a set of scales uh, because there's no point in setting this up unless you know what it is you're actually setting up. But you can get pretty close. So any questions before I start getting into the how-to? Not yet. Not yet. And I've had questions about... Um, you know, is it worth setting the car up asymmetrically for certain track? You know, if you've got one braking corner where you're always light on the right front wheel, should you adjust with that? It's certainly at a very high level of car preparation that is being done. We're not going to cover that today. I'm going to set up a good all-round balanced left to right car without, uh, without any real sort of site-specific tweaks. We have a question, Travis. What are the symptoms and how do you know if your car needs corner weight? Symptoms and how, what are the symptoms and how do you know if your car needs corner weighting? It's like it's a little bit like an alignment, isn't it? You know, it could be really, really, it can be in the ballpark and you'll never notice, but it gets really good and all of a sudden the car just works that much better. Um, symptoms are often, if you do have trouble with, say, one corner locking up before the other uh, under hard braking, you know, if it's always the right front that locks up, I would definitely check the corner weights on that car to see if you have a light diagonal. Um, also, if it has trouble with traction on the left rear of a corner, for example, the opposite corner is like that. Um, if the ride height is, is all jacked up, the car sitting crooked, uh, that's not necessarily an indication that you have a corner weight problem. It's an indication that your corner weighting may not have been done well or someone didn't pay any attention, in which case I'd check it out anyway. Um, and another way to tell, and you can tell by looking at this, is if you look at your shocks on the car and you have adjustable purchase, if one side is radically different than the other, that's an indication that the corner weighting is going to be off. Because, you know, if this is a rear shock, which it isn't, it's a front. Okay, it's a front shock. Um, and one perch is here and one perch is here. That higher one is going to have a lot more load on it and that diagonal is going to be heavy. And I'll bet if you look on the opposite corner, you're going to see the opposite. You're going to see the other side low, the other side high. So the spring perches should be roughly equal side to side. Front to back doesn't matter, but side to side. And that's a good indication that your car is probably in the ballpark. When they're installed on the car, right? Not when they're off. When they're installed, in the, yes, uh, Travis was asking, when they're installed in the car. Yeah, my suggestion whenever you are installing coilovers is always set them the same side to side um, when you're putting them on the car because it will make your corner weighting adventure that much less adventuresome. Um, it, it's going to get you in a better place to start with. So if you just set them randomly to some sort of random place and then adjust so that you're approximately the right height you want to be, chances are your corner weights are going to be all jacked up. If you start with them match side to side, chances are you're going to be in a much better place. Travis, the questions are coming in now. I can tell from looking at your face. <laughs> so the first one, what's the general pattern that emerges in regards to each coilover's adjustment? For example, the left front is usually shorter when everything is set. Okay, the question is, what is the pattern that you usually see when everything's adjusted? And it's like, you know, for example, is the right front usually shorter? And that's an indication. I think that answer will become more obvious as I go through this. If you do have one corner that's radically different from the others, you do not have a good corner weight job. Um, or you have a bent car, one or the other. Um, you, should, you, you should end up with the very similar side to side. And again, we cannot use this to try to make one corner heavier. It's going to be a diagonal. Um, if you're trying to make the right front heavier, you're also going to make the left rear heavier, and you're going to take weight off 
the left front and the right rear. It doesn't, you're not adding weight anywhere. If you want to move weight from the front to the rear, you're going to have to physically move something, like a battery. Was there a second question, Travis? There is a second question. Questions uh, are good. Is corner weight balancing beneficial to an everyday driver or just for a race car? Is it beneficial to an everyday driver or just a race car? Um, I guess that depends on how hard you push your everyday driver. Uh, it's not liable in extreme situations, really extreme situations. I can see how it could mess with tire wear a little bit because you're putting more load on the heavy diagonal. In reality, it's unlikely um, that you would never notice. Um, if you are pushing your car hard enough that you are, you know, exploring the limits of traction uh, on the street or the autocross course, hopefully, um, then it may be beneficial. Travis, we have another question. Last one so far. <laughs> At what point do you just give up and move to using corner weights? At what point do you give up and move to using corner weights? Like physically hanging weights off the car. Never. Never. <laughs> no. That's an example of when you're tuning a car, one of the things you always do is concentrate on the corner, on the part that's not working. Don't mess with the part that is working. So don't hang weights on one corner because you can't get it heavy enough because really what you should be concentrating on is making the other one lighter. But anyway, so I'm going to start with, I'm going to walk through how to corner weight a car. I'm using my trusty steed here as an example. It's mostly straight. Um, now what I have done so far is I have set the car up so that those perch heights are roughly the same side to side. Again, front to back doesn't matter, but roughly the same side to side, because that gets me in the ballpark. I've disconnected the sway bars, because the purpose of the sway bars is to transfer load one side or the other, and they're gonna mask what's really going on. Um, I have softened the shocks up, because that just keeps the shocks from, when they're, when they're shuttling the car, when they're dropping it down, it, it gets the shocks out of the way. And it is mounted on a set of our Paco Motorsports hub stands. We'll take a look at those in a moment. But if this was on, on its wheels, which it can be, um, I'll I would have made sure that all of the tires were at the same and correct pressures. Now, if you want to set a car up for a very specific situation, say, you know, three ounces of fuel and a driver only for an autocrosser, then I would recommend you put a weight equivalent to that driver in the driver's seat. And if you want to be really good, you've got to weight a dummy or a helper to sit in there. Uh, and provide the ballast for you and also have the correct amount of fuel in the tank. We currently have about a half tank of fuel in this thing right now. Fuel doesn't really change the corner weighting um, because it's central in the car. But again, if you are tuning for a very specific use case, it's always best to be as close as possible to that use case. We have a question, Travis. I um, figured this was a good time for this one. Um, Ed has an FM Stage 2.5 kit for his NA. Uh, he's going to be installing soon. Should he check the current ride heights at each wheel before installing them to see if he needs sleeves or corner balancing as necessary? Okay, the question is, uh, he's got a stage 2.5 kit, which means it's, a, it's an NA. Uh, he's about to install. Should he check his current ride heights before installation to see if it needs adjustable sleeves for corner weighting? I would say no. Um, you know, for street use, for the sort of car that I would usually recommend a stage 2.5 kit, it's unlikely you're going to need to corner weight. And this is not a sort of thing where the car is undrivable if it's not done. This is fine tuning. This is taking advantage of adjustments you put in. Um, if the car is bent, then it's good to know where they are. Um, if the car is abnormally low or high in one end on that particular case, because it uses NA upper mounts in the front, those can collapse. And I would check to make sure that those have not collapsed. That would be more important to me than trying to assume if the car needs adjustable perches. The problem with adjustable perches is then you're restricted. This is, this is a plus and minus. You end up using a standard spring diameter, which is not necessarily the same four inch spring diameter, three and a half, four inch, I forget what it is, of a standard Miata spring. So you're gonna have to go to a different spring set. And uh, then you may not be able to get the ride heights, the lengths, the sort of things you're looking for. So it opens up a bunch of other uh, potential compromises. Travis, we have a question. Two quick questions. I'm not ever getting around to the car. I know, well, <laughs> um, but we'll keep this conversation going. This is good. I like questions. So the first one is, if the car, if the owners of the car are multiple drivers with an extreme couple hundred pound weight difference, should they take that into account when corner balancing the car? So the question is, if you have multiple, this is an endurance car sort of situation or, or shared car, if you have multiple drivers with extreme weight differences, should you take that into account when corner weighting the car? And this is a sort of situation where if you do actually have access to a set of scales and you can check the, the corner balancing that's going on, I would throw those different people in there. Um, 
it's unlikely to make a massive difference. It's going to make a difference to how much weight is on each side of the car, but the diagonal distribution, because of where the driver sits in the Miata, is unlikely to be enormously affected. Um, if you're going for that last one-tenth of one percent, you may end up with one driver either has to bring along a hundred pound uh, weight to sit on, or you're going to have to accept that you're going to have to come up with a halfway situation where you're 50 pounds off for both drivers. It's, it's unlikely you're going to end up being quite that fine-tuned. And I'm, I have not done the experimentation, but I'm pretty sure you're going to find that the corner weighting, the actual diagonal balance, is going to be awfully close. Travis is looking distracted. He's trying oh, to yeah, read questions just, at the same time. <laughs> um, on top of the driver's weight, do you need to take into account any downforce from aero? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Downforce from aero. I'm going to say no on that one. Do you need to take uh, downforce from aero into account along with the driver's weight? Sorry, I need to repeat these so you don't know what they say. Um, I don't think so because in theory, your downforce should be equally distributed across each end of the car, meaning that you know, you're not going to have a wing on the left front corner. You'll have it across you know, the entire front or the entire rear. So your increase in weight across that front will be, will be equal across both wheels. And again, that's what we're looking for is we're looking to equalize the diagonals. If you increase the weight on the front or the weight on the tail, whether it's from aerodynamic forces or we're from actual heavy stuff, it should be equally distributed between the, between the wheels. So it's unlikely that's going to make a big difference. Um, interesting question, though. I'd never really taken that into account. Um, it would be a difficult thing to arrange unless you want to stack weights up on top of your wing. Um, I would like to see someone try that. Please do. If you have access to a, uh, to a set of scales and you are at the point where you are developing significant downforce on your race car and you're watching this car learning how to use, or this video learning how to use uh, your, your coilover setup, please write to us. Let us know how that worked out. I don't think it's going to make a difference. This is more for dynamic, um, dynamic behavior, I think, is probably the best way to look at this. So, are we, are we free of questions for now, Travis? Well, last one you kind of covered. Um, does a full or empty fuel tank affect the corner weighting? Does a full or empty fuel tank affect the corner weighting? And the answer is not really no, because the, corner, the, the fuel tank is centrally located in the car. So adding fuel to the car adds it to both sides at the same time. Um, if the fuel tank was in the left rear corner, you may have a problem there because it's going to make that diagonal heavy, and you may want to readjust in that case. So this little classic Mini that Travis is standing here beside, for example, only has a fuel tank in one corner. And so this car, yes, you would, it, it's corner weight, I apologize for the dust, it's corner weight would be different uh, depending on whether it had a fuller or uh, empty tank. If it was a real Cooper, you would have twin tanks on each side. So maybe that's one of the reasons they did that. Anyway, it's not. So we're starting off, we have, uh, we have set the car level. And one other thing that I've done, and this is often overlooked, is I've set the ride height and the rake where I want it to be. And this is very important um, because the adjustments you make to change the ride height, to change the rake, can affect your corner balance. And so I'm going to show you how to corner balance a car without changing its ride height, without changing its rates, its, uh, its rake, you know, how it sits on its, on its wheels. If it's done well, this thing should come off the stands at exactly the same ride height it went on and with the same stance, you know, left, right, whatever it is, uh, that, it, that it did when it went on. A sign of someone who doesn't completely understand corner weighting or hasn't done a good job of it is a car coming off the scales of one corner way up in the air. Um, we are going to avoid that. So it's important to set the... <coughs> Sorry, there's a lot of smoke in the air here right now because of wildfires. <coughs> um, it's important to set the right height of the car, the stance of the car, you know, the, the rake of it, before it goes on the scales. Because this way you'll start with where you want to be. And again, like I said, set the, uh, set the purchase so that they're the same height side to side because that'll get you in the right place if possible. So... Let's have a look at what we're using on the wheels here. We are using a set of hub stands. This is an older set because uh, of the ones that we have kicking around the shop. Um, but these make corner weighting easier. They're not a requirement, but they help a lot when you're shooting a video because you can see what I'm actually doing in here. Um, but they also, they don't load up. When you are corner weighting a car on tires, uh, and you may realize this from working with them, when you drop the car onto the wheels, the suspension will not fully relax until it's been rolled a little bit. And so our corner weights will be a little bit funky unless we can put the car in its wheels, push it back, push it forward, push it back, bounce it up and down a little bit and sort of settle the suspension. These guys have wheels on the bottom, which allows them, allows the suspension to settle as it's dropped down. It just makes life a lot easier. Um, so we're using these. These are available from Fly Miata, of course, slightly different, you know, a newer version of them, but they're not critical to the job. These scales are. Now, this is a set of proper race scales from Longacre Racing. 
Um, you can do this using various creative things with uh, bathroom scales. There's all sorts of interesting concepts made up to, uh, to use two bathroom scales with a board between them, stuff like that. We're not gonna be doing that today because this is gonna be a lot easier. But basically you need a way to measure the weight at all four corners. And that's what, uh, that's what we'll be using here today. This is an old set, we've had these kicking around for years. Um, new ones are wireless, but still they're effectively just four load cells. And then a readout that shows the actual wheel weights on each corner. It's not very interesting right now. I'll drop the car down and we'll get our first read. Now these scale pads should be set up to be as level as possible. Uh, if you try to do this on a hill, uh, you're going to end up with some weight shifted to one side or if you have a low corner especially, it's really going to mess with you. There we go. Um, so you do want to have these as level as possible. My concrete floor is good enough for the purposes of the demonstration of today. So this, uh, this guy shows us our total weights. And you can tell just from looking at this, we've got a heavy corner here. Our right front is really heavy compared to the others. And look at that, our, uh, our left rear is heavier than the right rear. So this car obviously has a heavy diagonal. And we can show the cross weight. This tells me that 55% of the weight of the car is on the right front left rear diagonal. I wrote it down. <laughs> I have to remember that um, because I'm using this all the time. This is the number we're interested in. We can't change the left right. This thing's perfectly balanced left to right, which is awesome. Um, we can't change the front to rear. I mean, I could put more fuel in the tank. That would put a heavier rear on the back. But uh, this is the only thing we can actually adjust by doing by adjusting the corner weights. So this is the number we're interested in. And 55.1, not awesome. Uh, we want to get that to as close to 50 as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down what I've got going on. I'd like to draw myself a little diagram. This is a car. It has four wheels and it has a front. And this is the heavy one. So I'm going to say it's 55.1%. And now I have a plan. I need to lighten this diagonal and make this diagonal heavier. So if we think back to our little spaceman with his little solid suspension, we need to make this legs of the table shorter and these legs of the table longer. So what I'll do is I will lower this diagonal by one turn and I'll raise this diagonal by one turn. Now a lot of people would look at this, at these wheel weights that I had with that really heavy uh, right front corner. It was the right front, wasn't it? Yeah, that really heavy right front corner and simply lower that corner. That's how you end up with the whole car leaning to one angle. If we lower both diagonals at the same time, then that means the car is going to stay level. By raising the opposite corners as well, that also means the ride height is going to be the same. Um, by, by, keeping, by adjusting all four corners by the same amount, but in different directions, we keep the ride height and the rake where it is. And that's an important trick. It seems like more work because you're doing more adjustment. But that is the key to keeping the car sitting level or, or nose high, whatever it is you're set up for, and keeping the ride height more or less where it is. We can go back to this guy. Let's use our little spaceman again. If you're just tuning in, yes, this is a little Lego thing. This is what we're dealing with right now. We have a heavy diagonal. This poor little car, all it's carrying a lot of its weight on these corners. If we simply lowered these corners, whoops, oh no, it's been a terrible accident. Um, if we lowered these corners, we might get it, come on, here we go. We might get it level, but it's going to be lower than it was because our average ride height would have been about half of one of these different. So if we, and I don't have a, I should have set this up with double thickness on these. If we adjust these ones up by a little bit and these ones down by a little bit, we can end up with the same average ride height and the same stance. Here's what happens if I only get rid of the one corner. See, now we've taken, we've shortened this one and he's still a little bit wobbly. Now he's got a whole bunch of weight back there. Anyway, so let's do this. One of the reasons I write this down is because invariably, by the time you get up to the car and you start looking at the wheel wells, you'll forget which one you're doing in which direction. It's much easier to adjust um, coilovers when there's no weight on them. Uh, you're going to be, especially when you're moving them up, you're fighting against, well, there's you know, 600 pounds of weight on each corner in this thing, so we don't want to do it. So looking at my notes here, I want to move this one up by a full turn. Now, it's always easiest to deal in full turns. When we get closer to being, to, to getting almost there, we may do partial turns. But in this case, I'm doing a full turn. I've already loosened off the locks on these to make it easier to show this up. 
And this car, because it's got helpers on the front, very easy to adjust. So that one went up by one turn. This one will go down by one turn. I have a fear I'm going to forget what I'm doing as I'm talking, and I'm going to put this thing back down, and it's going to be completely jacked up. This one will go up by a turn. Where's my... There it is. These rears are a little harder to adjust. Got a little more weight on them, a little more, a little more load at full droop. Just a matter of geometry. Okay, and this one goes down. Now these are loose enough. This particular car, race car, short, short stiff springs, they're fairly unloaded at droop. Um, if you do have a significant amount of load on the spring, you may have to use a coilover wrench to do what I just did. Um, the end result is the same. I'm just moving these perches up and down. And the reason I do one, one turn at a time is just so I can see what's going on. So now we drop it down. Do we have any questions, Travis? There we go. Now, if the car was sitting on its tires at this point, I would have to push it back and forth. Ideally, I'd have some little roll-on ramps uh, on the edge of this thing to sort of settle it. But because this thing's on the hub stands, we're pretty close already. So let's have a look. Hey, progress. So now we are at 52.7. We're definitely going in the right direction. We're not there, but we're halfway there. So that's pretty good. So the reason I keep notes like this is because it's easy to go back and see what you did. If you get yourself in a situation that's not working, you can, or you turn something the wrong way, you can work backwards and get back to where you were. So I'm just going to do the same thing because I'm awfully close. I'm going the right direction. And it's also fun to make notes of, you know, we are total 23, 23, not bad for a V8 Miata. And 50% cross side, 43 point seven rear. So she's a little nose heavy, but she also got half a tank of gas. And well, like I said, you take weight out of a car, it mostly comes out of the back. So let's lift it up and we'll do it again. Now, pretty soon we're going to get in the situation. So let's see, this corner goes up. I gotta, you get this wrong and you start chasing your tail like you would not believe. Um, we're going to end up with a situation where we start saying, how close do you have to get? You know, I'd love to see a 50.0. I just turned that up. Just grab these things and turn it up by a turn. I'd love to get to a 50.0 cross weight. In reality, being a, a tenth or two off is not unsurprising. And you do get a little bit of shift as you measure it anyway. So this one's going down. Sometimes it's easier to do the diagonal, so you do two down and two up. I'm risking it here on live television. There it is. This one's getting a little tight, a little hard to turn. There we go. And this one goes down. I see what down as it gets easier. There we go. Okay, we'll drop it back on its little feet again. And Travis, watch, watch one of the hub stands as it comes down. You'll see it move out. And that's what the hub stand allows that a wheel won't. It's probably more obvious on the front, but you can, as the suspension relaxes, you can see that hub stand sort of spread apart, allow the suspension to move. Ho, ho, ho. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Look at that. 50.0. Absolutely perfect. I'd love to say it works like this every time. Oh, there we go. It just shifted 50.1. Um, I'd love to say it works like that every time, but it doesn't. You can see there's a little bit of noise in the system. There's a couple of pounds moving back and forth. That's fair enough. So we are now at 50.1, and I'm going to call that close enough. You'll never really get any closer. There you go. 50.0. It just circled out. <laughs> it keeps moving. There's one pound on one of these, uh, one of these scales is shifting and that's what's giving us that 0.1%. But you can see now we're much better. But notice how the front rear hasn't changed at all. And the ride height, the total weight, yeah, it keeps changing by one pound, but the, uh, that is not gonna change. The side and side weight is still 50.5 or 50.0 side to side. That's not gonna change and it isn't gonna change because you can't. 
you can't shift weight front to back. You can't shift it side to side. You can only shift it on those, on those diagonals. So we look at this now. You can still see, you can see the front is actually very nicely balanced. If you want to have a look over here, Travis. Because this car has such good side to side balance, you can see that the fronts are very closely matched and the rears are very closely matched. So if we, you can see just a little bit more on this one diagonal. So I could mess with that by doing a quarter turn, by doing an eighth of a turn. It gets hard to be accurate there. So you can see if we added a whole bunch of weight in the front, it would still be evenly distributed across the front or a whole bunch of weight in the rear with a wing, um, which this car runs when it's on the track. Uh, so it wouldn't really change the diagonal, but it would, uh, it would change the front to rear balance. Do you have any questions there, Travis? We've got two. First is, is this the max that you would do? What other adjustments would you make pending what's discovered for a starting point halfway or completed? Just pulling up the question that you sent me earlier. Um, so the question is, what else would we, would we do? And this is really all you, well, this is the fundamentals of corner weighting. Um, if you discover that the car is massively heavy in the front as opposed to the rear, and you've got a front battery, you know, this is the point where you start thinking, can we move something else to the back? Um, or can we, you know, should the fire extinguisher bottle not be underneath the driver's leg? Should it be in the trunk? Stuff like that. Do we want to move stuff around? Or where do we put our ballast? If you're in a racing class that requires a minimum weight and you're running ballast, this is the sort of thing that can help you decide where to put it. You're going to put it on that light corner, wherever it is. So you can make that sort of determination while you're doing this. Um, but there's really, you don't have a lot of other tools to deal with. Um, this is effectively it when you're dealing with corner weight balance. You, you can't shift stuff front to back, side to side. You can only adjust those diagonals. So you set those diagonals to be as close as possible to even if you are building an all-purpose car for all use, if you are building for a very specific um, racetrack where you really want a lot of extra load on the right front corner for one particular corner, then you may want to skew this. And I'm not going to get to that point here, but chances are you're not watching this video if you're at that level already anyway. Travis, question. Uh, first one. What chassis discoveries and takeaways have you made regarding the different chassis in A and B and C and D when you've been corner weighting these? So what chassis discoveries or chassis-related discoveries have we made while corner weighting um, the different generations? I can't say we've learned anything fundamental while corner weighting cars because they all work about the same. Um, you know, we certainly learn things like how easy it is to change the rear shocks in an ND. They will literally fall out, uh, which is awesome, but um, you know, it doesn't really affect the, the corner weighting. You don't learn a lot about suspension geometry doing this because you're simply looking at the weight being supported by each corner of the car. So you can't, uh, you can't learn a lot from that. You can learn a few things from ride height adjustments. You know, you get a ride height adjustments and motion ratios are tied together. So in the rear of an ND, for example, it's got a motion ratio of almost one to one. So the amount of adjustment you need to make for a given ride height change is much um, smaller than it is on a car with the, this one with a, with a much lower motion ratio. But that's something you can learn by measuring. <laughs> Travis, we have more questions. Um, what type of shop typically will do corner balancing for you, and how much does it usually cost? Uh, there's a very good question right there. What kind of shop usually can do corner balancing for you, and how much does it cost? Um, the same sort of shop that can do a very good alignment for you can probably also do corner weight for you, or they know someone who can. And a good way to find these shops is to look to see what's parked out front or parked out back. If there's a circle track car back there, um, if there's a race car of some sort, Drag cars, less so, but still, motorsports, you have an indication that shop is owned and operated by a bunch of guys who do motorsports, and if they don't have a set of scales, they know who does. Um, Sears will not do this for you, uh, even if they're still in business. Walmart won't. Um, how much it costs, it's probably going to be charged by the hour. If you come in with a car that's very close to being properly set up, then it won't take as long to do. It'll be much less expensive. Um, and the better the guys are at it, you know, Roger Krauss Racing in, in Hayward or San Francisco, the Bay Area, California, those guys are really, really good. They can set up a Miata super fast because they've done so many of them. And spec Miata shops are going to be like that as well. Um, a shop that's used to dealing on a different car might take a little bit longer to do. It may cost you more. It's hard to say. You'll have to ask the shop on that one because shop prices vary so much across the country. Travis, we have a question. When you're life hacking this, can you use bathroom scales? 
can you use bathroom scales if you are life hacking, which I guess is trying to, means trying to do it as cheap as possible. Um, yes, as long as your bathroom scales can read up to 654 pounds in this case. Um, hopefully you are shopping at the hefty store for your bathroom scales. Uh, if you have bathroom scales that only go to 350, then you can put two of them side by side, put a board on top. Um, you're going to have to do some reading, do some math. And there are some interesting mechanisms people have come up with, with lever arms, uh, you know, pivot points at one end. Um, some of the classic books, I think Fred Poon's, P-U-H-N, I think his chassis dynamic books has some, some suggestions on how to do that. I've never done a lot of experimentation with it because I've been lucky enough to have access to a set of proper, uh, these proper scales the entire time I've been doing corner weighting. So I have not experimented with some of the more creative ways of doing it, but hey, it's all, in, all just engineering. All you need is some way of measuring a load and then some way of making sure that load doesn't exceed the measurement of that thing you're using for the load. So there you go. Yes, you can use bathroom scales uh, for a very heavy planet. <laughs> Travis, do you have any more questions? I'm trying to see if I have some of my questions here. Do I have to have specific questions? Uh, adjustable end links. Okay. Um, what's the best way to do this at home? Sorry, I'm just reading the, uh, reading the questions that were sent in earlier to make sure that I hit all of them. Um, so adjustable end links. The thing, now that you've got this car set up, this is where adjustable end links come into play. Now that this car is set up so that it's, it's sitting level, it's sitting balanced where it wants to be. Um, and like I said, it should have gone onto the scales already set up, level side to side, level front to back, you know, or rake, whatever you're looking for. But at this point, when you go, when you reattach the sway bars, uh, let me get my bolts here. There they are. When you reattach the sway bars, oh, you can't see it at all. Someone's put brake duct and stuff all over the place. Um, you should be able to slide them into the sway bars. You can't see squat in here. I can't even see them. Um, you, you should be able to slide the sway bars into the end link or end link into the sway bars without having to force things into place. And that's where an adjustable end link can come in handy is you can make sure that the end links are just the right length so that you're not having to sort of force the bar, preload that bar, in order to get the end links on. Um, you really shouldn't have to do that if the bar's been built straight, um, or if you've got the car with a whole bunch of stagger, uh, because you're a circle track racer, the Miata circle track racing community, um, shout out. Uh, you may have to have adjustable end links to take the preload out of that bar. Generally speaking, it's just a very fine tuning, fine tuned little, little piece, but it will keep any sway bar preload from messing with your, uh, messing with your, your carefully set up corner balances. Do you have another question there, Travis? Okay, well, I hope that was useful to somebody. Um, there's a few, a few tips and tricks in there that I've sort of developed and, and uh, learned over the years. The biggest one of which is you cannot shift weight front to back. I've said this probably six or seven times at this point, but I cannot emphasize that enough. If you were trying to get more rear weight in a car, lifting the rear up so it looks like an old school dragster is not going to do it. Um, if you, uh, you can only shift weights on the diagonal from one diagonal to the other one. And um, if you adjust all four corners at the same time in opposite directions for each diagonal, you will end up with a car that sits level or sits where you put it, that is right height is where you left it, and the car will come in to focus much more quickly than if you're just jacking one corner at a time. Um, I have, I have gone down that path before where I've done one corner time and the car gets off the scales and it's one. So yeah, you definitely want to do all four at one time. It's not the way everyone chose to do it, but it's the way I found has been the most effective at coming up with a car that looks like it was done by a professional and it sits level and sits the way I want it to. So my arrow works the way I want it to. And so it doesn't look like it was done by, you know, someone who just borrowed some scales and had no clue what they were doing, which is more or less where I started. Uh, if you have any more questions, Travis, do we have a question there? You're making faces. We have one. I'm not sure if I understand what he's saying. <laughs> it's on in links, hardware sliding in when the car is on the ground. Okay, but, and the question is, it sounds like short form, on end links, hardware sliding in when the car is on the ground. Um, so yes, th that's basically what I was saying earlier about when you're hooking up your, your end links, hooking up your sway bars, the hardware, whether it's a, a stud on a ball joint or whether it's a bolt going through an end link or whatever it is, it should slide in easily. Um, when the car is sitting on its wheels. And effectively, the car, this car is sitting on its wheels right now. The fact that it's on hub stands makes no difference. Um, but you should be able to. Let's go around to the back. You might be able to see, see it more easily. There's less stuff back here. 
I don't usually run a rear sway bar in this car, but it's here anyway, look at that. So when I go to put this hardware in, there we go, it's not hooked up on the other side. When one side's hooked up, the other side should slide in easily. So it can just slip in there. And that's the way it should be. If I have to pull this, I don't know if you can see that. If I have to pull the sway bar, if I have to torque the sway bar in order to get this in, that means that I'm pre-doting the bar. It's trying to turn the car one way. It's trying to lift one corner. Uh, and so what I need to do is adjust my end link so that we'll just slide right in. Which I can't see what I'm doing, but as you saw a moment ago, that's what I did. Here's a neat trick too, look at this. I use pins with removable, what do you call those things, hitch pins? Removable uh, pins in them so I can easily connect and disconnect the sway bar at the track for fine tuning this car. It's, uh, it's very much a race car thing because it will make a little bit of noise. But that's a trick that, uh, that I started doing a while ago for when I'm doing lots of chassis setup at the track. I was working on a spec me out of the other day and looked in the, uh, looked in the wheel well and I saw that. I was like, oh, I forgot I worked on this car. But I had. Uh, any more questions? Okay, if you do have questions, put them in the comments. Uh, we will not answer them live, obviously, but uh, we will answer them in the comments. We will try to address all of your questions. Hopefully you learned a little bit something about how to set a car up for that final little bit, if you have the, the setup or the, the technology available to do it. And uh, hopefully this will help your tires last better. It'll help you brake better, help you put down more traction out of the corners and generally make your Miata happier. That's pretty much it for today. Uh, my name is Keith Tanner from Fly Miata. Thanks for your attention and we'll see you again next week. Thank <laughs> you.